Africa. It is therefore now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Thanks to the Financial Accountability Office, we now know that Ontario does not have a balanced budget. The books, the books were cooked for an election illusion. The FAO said the Liberals won't. I'm sorry, but that phrase can't be used to please withdraw. Again. Uh, withdraw. Fair, carry on. The FAO said the Liberals won't be able, I quote, to balance the budget without significant fiscal policy adjustments. I repeat, significant fiscal policy adjustments. What does that mean for a Liberal? It means either hidden new taxes or frontline service cuts. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, given what the F FAO has clearly said, what will it be? Question. Is it going to be new taxes right. or is it going to be cuts to frontline service? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I really appreciate the work of the Financial Accountability Officer, and I'm, I was. The member from Leeds Grenville will withdraw. The person that continues that trend. It's unparliamentary, and I won't accept it. Premier. I, you know, I was pleased, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, his economic forecasts are broadly in line with ours, uh, showing strong economic momentum in 2017 and 2018 and confirming strob, strong job gains. Mr. Speaker, His analysis is also in line with the major Canadian banks and financial institutions, and they also predict Ontario will continue to lead Canada in economic growth. Mr. Speaker, That is very good news for uh, the people of Ontario. Our unemployment rate is at its, the lowest that it's been in 16 years years. Great news and has been below the national average for Answer. the last two years, Mr. Speaker. So I thank the, uh, the FAO for his report and, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've got a, a good, strong outlook and he agrees with that. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and I get the Premier's talking point is to thank the FAO, and that may sound good, but the reality is the FAO is calling this government's budget a charade, a sham. You know, look, look at what the, has actually been said. The FAO is projecting continued Ontario budget deficits over the next five years. I quote, 2017-18, the FAO projects a deficit due to more taxes and a $3 billion boost from one-time non-tax revenues. Ontarians will not be fooled. The FAO is saying your numbers do not add up. Ontario has, does not have a balanced budget. This is a significant yeah. deficit. And if I'm supposed to believe, if I'm supposed to believe the FAO or this Liberal government, I'm with the FAO. The non-partisan legislative oversight Question. is calling the government out. Will you do the right thing? Will the Premier admit we still have a huge deficit in Ontario? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question uh, from the member opposite, recognizing that the FEO has also revised his numbers uh, from the spring to the fall, increasing the economic growth that the province of Ontario has been having, recognizing that trends are improving over time. The FEO makes reference to that, Mr. Speaker. And independent forecasters have also assessed it, and we have actually taken their projections, tapered it down in order to be prudent in our projections going forward. But what's really important, Mr. Speaker, is the actual numbers. And actual numbers, year over year, have always exceeded our budget and our targets. This coming year, we, pro we project a deficit of $4.5 billion. It's now down to $1.5 billion and improving, Mr. It's going to calm down. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the Minister of Finance is saying the only thing that counts is the actual numbers, while the FAO is saying we have a deficit well beyond $5 billion. Right. So how is it possible that we've got a Premier and a Minister of Finance who have the audacity to say to the people of Ontario we have a balanced budget when we don't? The nonpartisan legislative oversight is saying your numbers do not add up. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure the government tells the truth to Ontarians. Is the FAO correct that your numbers do not add up? Is the FAO correct that we don't have a balanced budget? Thank you. Minister of Finance. The FAO is correct that Ontario's economy is improving. 
The FBO is correct that we are trending downward. The FBO is correct that our debt to GDP inches away from warnings. Answers will be heard by me. Finish, please. And those are projections by the FBO, which we actually do appreciate. In fact, we appreciate others in their inputs so that we can then taper and tape. Member from Durham, come to order. And thanks to him, we're in warnings. Oh. Oh. Speaker, we put forward a budget, and it's a living document. We always overcome challenges as they proceed, and we take those efforts. But what the member opposite is doing, Mr. Speaker, is he voting against uh, pharma care for children. He's voting against increased funding for hospitals. He's voting for increased funding for schools. He's voting for the elimination of free tuition for our students, Mr. Speaker. He's voting against the very measures that improves our economy to enable us to come to balance. Thank you. Yeah, both of you. New question. Leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the budget deficit, I'm going to ask the Premier something directly. We've heard other government ministers try to give their spin on this, but I want to hear directly from the Premier. What does a $120,000 giant rubber ducky have to do with Canada's 150th anniversary? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm uh, I'm happy to take this question. I want to thank the member opposite. You know, um, when we say yes to festivals like we did with the Waterfront Toronto Festival at $121,000, Speaker, we did so confident it would leverage the kind of results this festival has led to in the past number of years, including six million dollars in tourism spend, Speaker. And we think that's a great return on investment. I don't know about the members opposite, but we absolutely agree that that's the case. And so, uh, what? The member from uh, excuse me. A member from Kitchener Conestoga is warned. And I'm going to get tighter. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. We have faith, Speaker, unlike the party opposite, in local tourism operators. Answer. We have faith in their ability to make good decisions about what is going to leverage tourism opportunities in their part of the province Thank and you. what's going to make it fun. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Now, I asked the question to the Premier, and I want the Premier on the record. I, I understand why the Premier is embarrassed that her government spent $121,000 on a giant rubber ducky. But if the Premier is actually. President, Treasury Board, and the member from Barrie are warned. Carry on. If the Premier can actually defend this, she's not going to send someone else out to defend it. She will say here in the House that her government is okay with spending $121,000 that we don't have. Remember, we're in deficit. $121,000 we don't have on a giant rubber ducky. Can the Premier say here today that she supports it? And if she won't, why won't she? You know, Speaker, uh, none of those arguments hold water, and the Leader of the Opposition knows it. And here's what else we know, Speaker, that, again, when we, when we have faith and confidence in these local organizers, they know what works. $121,000 that we are leveraging in this festival, Speaker, is now being leveraged among six municipalities, Speaker, and that's really important because, you know what, the opposite, member opposite says, says it's shameful. You know what's shameful? That the party opposite doesn't understand the importance of local tourism investments and is completely out of touch. Completely out of touch with what municipalities want. You are completely out of touch. I also want to add, Speaker, that the member from Brock has something interesting to say that, and, and was quoted as saying that these activities are not only an important part of life in our towns and villages, but provide a real boost to our local tourism economy. Thank you. I stand you sit. Ministers, to be reminded that when I stand, you sit. 
Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd have more empathy for the Premier if she said we made a mistake. We shouldn't have spent $121,000 on a giant rubber ducky when the province is in deficit. The reality is we have homeless men and women on our streets, children can't get funding for autism, nurses are being fired, and yet this government thinks it's good value of taxpayer funds to spend $121,000 on the giant rubber ducky. And I understand the Premier's staff are probably telling her, don't get clipped on this, have someone else defend this ugly government policy. But once again, a third time to the Premier, will you defend your decision to sign off on $121,000 for a giant rubber ducky, yes or no? Please. Please it, please. Thank you. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. The member from Trinity Spadina is warned. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Minister. You know, Speaker, um, I know that the leader. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. Who's next? Try it from this place. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, I know that the Leader of Opposition doesn't want to talk about the increase in minimum wage or the labour reforms that we're proposing on this side of the House, Speaker. I know that he doesn't want to talk about that. So he's ragging the puck, Mr. Speaker, and he's put it over to me, and I'm quite happy to take it, and here's why. Because not only is this festival in Toronto going to bring tourists from around the world to Toronto, and that's why the City of Toronto gave $75,000 to this festival, but it's because five other municipalities across our province said yes to. And what did they say yes to? They told us that they want to take this Answer. duck around the province, Speaker, and it's going to the Leader of the Opposition's riding. So is he going to call local is he going to call local organizers and tell them that the duck can't come? Thank That's you. what I want to know, Mr. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Please. The member from Etobicoke North is warned. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. This session, the Premier has done nothing but plow ahead with her own agenda to try and save herself and her party before the next election. Take hydro, for example. The Premier went ahead with her wrong headed Hydro One sell off, even though 80% of Ontarians are against it. Does the Premier think she knows more than 80 per cent of Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, you know, um, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of days to, uh, to talk about specifically the changes that we are making to labour laws and employ employment standards, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the minimum wage. And all of that, Mr. Speaker, is part of a plan. It's part of uh, the reality that government, in my opinion, exists to help people. It exists to do things that we cannot do alone. <laughs> government exists to make society more fair. So whether that's free tuition for students uh, who will see that this fall, over 200,000 students will go to college and university. They will get free or better than free tuition, Mr. Speaker. Whether it is cutting people's electricity bills, whether it's building 100,000 new childcare spaces, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's raising the minimum wage and making sure that yes, part-time and full-time workers are paid the same, Mr. Speaker. All of that is about a fair Ontario. That's what we've been doing this Thank session, you. Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm not surprised the Premier doesn't want to talk about Hydro One. Under this Liberal government, hydro rates have gone up by a staggering 300%. Under this Premier alone, rates have gone up 
Instead of doing something to fix the mess that she's helped create in our hydro system, the Premier signed Ontario families and businesses onto a $45 billion borrowing scheme that will cause our hydro bills to soar even higher. What does the Premier have to say to the people who will be hurt by her scheme? Mr. Speaker, you know I know the uh, I know the member opposite. I know him quite well, and I know that he is committed to, for example, building transit. Mr. Speaker, I know that he believes in infrastructure building. I also know that he recognizes that over many years, because he knows a lot about the electricity system in Ontario, over many years, government after government did not make the investments in the electricity system in Ontario that were needed. The system was degraded by the time we came into office in 2003 under the previous uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker, there had to be investments in order to upgrade the system. We made those investments, Mr. Speaker, and we are paying now for those in this generation, and we believe that it is more fair to pay for those uh, investments over a longer period of time. That's what Answer. we're doing in order that people can see some relief right now, and they will see that relief come Thank this you. summer, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, indeed, I do know the system, and privatization is damaging the hydro in this province. Damaging it. The Premier didn't even give the people of Ontario, or the opposition for that matter, reasonable time to have their say about her hydro scheme. She's ramming it through the House in a little over two weeks. Two weeks for legislation that will affect our lives for three decades to come. Why does the Premier insist on limiting public input? An opposition debate on our hydro scheme. What is she afraid of? Mr. Speaker, uh, there has been an enormous uh, debate and discussion around this province about the cost of electricity. The member opposite knows that. Uh, we're moving forward to give people relief by this summer, Mr. Speaker, because we know that that will help people and it will help small businesses on uh, main streets all over the province, Mr. Speaker. They will see a reduction in their electricity costs, and people in uh, more rural and uh, remote communities will see up to a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. I believe that it was an important decision to move ahead, Mr. Speaker. I also know that the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, was part of our plan to invest in the people of this province, invest in infrastructure. We were not, as the member opposite uh, is, I believe, Mr. Speaker, constrained by an ideology that says that never work with the private sector, do not trust the yes, private sir. sector, Mr. Speaker. I believe that the way society works is that government, private sector, civil society works together to improve the lot of lives in people, of the people of Ontario. Any question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Yeah, well, I don't consider a 30 minutes debate to be adequate time. Again, to the Premier. After months of heartbreaking story after heartbreaking story, the Premier still doesn't get that families are at a tipping point. They can't afford more of her hydro rate hikes. So why does the Premier insist on pushing ahead with a plan that even the nonpartisan financial accountability officer says will end up costing Ontarians more on their hydro bills in the long run? More in their hydro bills. Why? Mr. Speaker, you know, the, um, the cutting of the electricity bills across the province is part of a broader recognition, Mr. Speaker, that we're living in a very uncertain global economy. Uh, uh, Ontario is doing very well, as uh, both the Minister of Finance and the FAO have uh, identified, Mr. Speaker. The economy is growing, but not everybody is sharing in that growth and that wealth evenly. And so cutting electricity bills, making sure that young people have access to post-secondary education, building childcare spaces and, Mr. Speaker, raising the minimum wage, making sure that people have the, uh, the resources that they need to look after themselves and their families. All of that is about building a fairer Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the member opposite understands that, and he knows exactly yes, why we're taking these measures, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Suppl supplementary. Again to the Premier, it's not just that she's sold off Hydro One or that she's ramming her borrowing scheme through this House. The Premier is also using the power of her office to advertise that scheme to Ontarians 
by forcing utility companies to include her Liberal Party messaging in people's hydro bills. Will the Premier admit that she is just using these political inserts to save her own skin before the next election? Thank you. You know, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that has concerned me and has concerned us is that uh, not everyone who's eligible for the Ontario um, uh, electricity Energy Support, support Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, actually have applied for it and know about it. So we're doing everything we can to make sure that people know about that program, Mr. Speaker, so that they can apply and they can get uh, a 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. And so we are we are making sure that that can happen, Mr. Speaker. As I said, I know that the member opposite knows that people in the province need relief. It's it's quite astonishing to me, Mr. Speaker, that I expect that he and his uh, his colleagues will be voting against that relief, Mr. Speaker. I think that uh, you know there's been enough discussion and they've talked to enough people as we have to know that people need relief. They need it now. And in fact, the member opposite brought uh, brought forward a plan with his party that, that actually would not have given people relief, certainly not in the short term, Mr. Speaker, yes, and maybe not ever. We're bringing relief to people. They're voting against it, Mr. Speaker. We know that people in the province need this relief right now. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. And we are voting against soaring hydro bills. No, make no mistake. Make no mistake. The Premier is focused on nothing but her own political fortunes this session. She's barreled ahead with a massively unpopular sell-off of Hydro One. She's allowed hydro rates to skyrocket. She's ramming through a $45 billion borrowing scheme that the FAO says will do nothing but drive hydro bills even higher. And she's forcing private companies to do some sneaky political maneuvering for her in their bills. Why does the Premier get that she can't win an election or improve her poll numbers by continuing to make decisions that sell out the people of this province. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that it's this Premier and this government that's bringing forward a plan that's going to be reducing bills for people right across the province by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. But let me, let me quote uh, Ontario Regional Chief Isidore Day. The elimination of the delivery charge will assist our citizens by reducing energy poverty in our communities. It also represents recognition for the use of the land in the development and the expansion of the provincial energy grid. Today's commitment by the Ontario government is commendable and allows a path forward for the greater quality of life for First Nations in Ontario. That is what they are voting against, Mr. Speaker. Let me quote Ava Hill. Each one of our community members will benefit from Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan. This is a step towards reconciliation and recognition of our inherent rights as treaty holders. That is what they are voting against, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are making a difference for every family in this province. That is what the opposition is voting against today, Mr. Speaker. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. No question. The member from Nipissing. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The headline on the financial accountability officer's release this morning says it all. Quote, FAO expects steady deterioration of Ontario's budget deficit. Despite the government announcing a so-called balanced budget, the FAO confirms this is only by using one-time revenue from the sale of Hydro One. He confirmed this is also due to using revenue from the one-time sale of buildings such as the OPG headquarters across the street. Speaker, what business in Canada would be allowed to pull the wool over their investors' eyes? Exactly. In the real world, people have gone to jail for pulling a stunt like that. Exactly. So I ask the Premier, Answer. will you fess up to the taxpayers and provide the real state of Ontario? listening very carefully to the question, and I'm concerned that there are some implications in it, and it will not uh, go any further off that line. And he knows what I'm talking about. Premier. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you uh, to the question, because it does give us an opportunity to reinforce uh, the tremendous growth in Ontario's economy, outpacing Canada, outpacing the U.S. 
the member wants to test it, I will. The member will withdraw. And because of these initiatives and efforts, we put forward a budget that not only is a balance, it's balanced this year, next year, and the year after that. Public accounts coming forward in the fall will reinforce that we've outperformed yet again, even last year. And those are actual numbers, Mr. Speaker. But the member opposite is asking a question. I will accept the challenge. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Someone else is very close. Carry on. But I say the member opposite is asking these questions because he and his party are uncomfortable with supporting Answer. our most vulnerable workers by increasing minimum wage. He even had the audacity to say the minimum wage Thank increase you. detracts from more important economic issues. Nothing is Thank you. Good choice. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. We know the government only announced a balanced budget through these one-time sales. They're going to run out of things to sell next year. Uh, so the financial accountability officer said the budget deficit will continue to deteriorate, quote, without additional government measures. We saw the government trying to balance the budget on the backs of frontline health care workers. Sure. They fired 1,600 nurses. We saw the government trying to balance the budget on the backs of students. The Liberals have closed more schools than any other government in the history of Ontario. So my question is to the Premier. Which group is she going to target next to continue this charade of balanced budgets? Great question. Thank you. So, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. we are always looking at our, our economic policy. We're always putting forward fiscal plans that enable us to grow our economy. We are, of course, looking at uh, assets that are unproductive and repurpose them to reinvest, Mr. Speaker, in making even greater contributions to our economy. And that is exactly what is happening. And part of that uh, contribution, Mr. Speaker, in this budget, is to increase support for our health care by $11.5 billion, which that member opposite is voting against. He's voting against an additional $9.5 billion more into our education. He's voting against pharmacare, free medicine for all young people under the age of 25, Mr. Speaker, and he's voting against free tuition for our students. He's voting against the very measures that enable our economy to succeed. And as I said before, he's distracting from the issues around yes, minimum sir. wage, and that is what affects the people of this province. We are talking about a plan for the people of Ontario for today and thank tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Niagara Health serves tens of thousands of families. Uh, some of who are with us here in the gallery today. They made that long trek on the QEW for three hours on a bus to be here, along with the Ontario Health Coalition, Natalie Mara and Sue Hutt. They brought over 2,500 letters that I will deliver actually to the Premier and the Health Minister uh, after question period from community members asking the government to stop the proposal to close hospitals in our riding. The Liberal government has a proposal in place to close more hospitals in South Niagara, in Welland, in Port Coburn, all based on a non-validated report issued in 2012 by Kevin Smith that experts describe as lacking in total evidence and reference and without any formal consultation with families in my community. And this, re this uh, restructuring will be unprecedented in Ontario. With, will the minister explain Question. to my friends that are here in the gallery today and those watching at home why the Liberal government refuses to put a stop to this short-sighted proposal? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to first uh, welcome and acknowledge the uh, members of the Ontario Health Coalition who are here this morning and other uh, community members uh, and leaders from Welland in the Welland area, the Niagara region, that have come, made that trip here today to advocate uh, on behalf of health care uh, in Ontario and in their region, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to begin, and I'll, I'll have more to say in the supplementary, but I want to begin by saying that that part Party voted against our budget, which allocated nine billion more dollars in capital infrastructure for hospitals, including a dedicated brand new hospital in Niagara for the Niagara region, Mr. Speaker. And it was the hard work not of that member opposite, but the member from St. Catharines, from the local Niagara mayor, Mayor Diodati, and many other uh, local leaders that have worked so hard over the years to get us to the place where we are today to be able to make that financial commitment to build a brand new hospital Thank for you. the Niagara region. Supplementary. 
Well, unfortunately, it's not cited in South Niagara, which is actually where the hospitals are closing. But in any event, we know that Niagara has one of the highest populations of seniors in the province, many of whom live on very low incomes. Worse, the region has the lowest, second lowest number of long-term care beds in the province. And studies uh, from the Niagara region show that the growth is actually going to be in South Niagara. So while Niagara Falls deserves a new hospital and needs one, Welland and Port Coburn and Waynefleet also deserve to have a hospital for their residents. And closing the hospital will have devastating impacts on not only economic development in the south end of Niagara, but on the people who live in our community. So I will ask again, will the minister listen to the experts and to the message brought from the constituents of my riding today Question. to put an immediate stop to the closure of the Welland and Port Coburn hospitals? Thank you. Proceed it, please. Proceed it, please. Thank you, Minister. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that I've spoken with her about uh, the hospitals in the region, including the Welland Hospital that she is most preoccupied with. I've met with Mayor Campion as well, Mr. Speaker. I've met with uh, other community leaders, other mayors in the region about Welland Hospital. She knows that I have been absolutely open and flexible to the future of the Welland Hospital. In fact, I have instructed my officials to, to demonstrate that flexibility. I grew up not very far from Welland. I understand the importance of that community hospital to the community, and I will do everything I can to work with my ministry and with the community to keep Welland open. That is my commitment. That is what we have been working towards. The member opposite knows that. I'm glad that the members in the, in the gallery also are here to, to listen to that commitment that we are working, and we are working with the Lynn, Answer. the local leadership, the mayors, the communities, everybody to find the right solution. Your, your question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, uh, residents in my riding of Trinity Spadina have different options to get to work and around the city. In my mind, the most convenient way is to bike, and I know that many in my community are passionate to biking. At the same time, there are many more in my community who want to choose cycling but feel that the necessary infrastructure isn't there to allow for them to ride around safely. Speaker, I am aware that on Monday, the Minister of Transportation was with the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports to make a very important announcement about our government's commitment to cycling. Would the minister please provide the member of this house with more information on how exactly we're making Ontario a better and safer place to ride a bike? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Trinity Spadina for his question and for his tireless advocacy on behalf of his community. Uh, this past Monday, I was very happy to stand alongside the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport as we made a very important announcement regarding the future of cycling here in Ontario. Speaker, you'll know and that in Budget 2017, we announced that we'll be investing $50 million to support commuter cycling infrastructure in our province. And, Speaker, on Monday, we were pleased to announce specifically that as part of this commitment, we'll be providing eligible municipalities from across the province with funding through the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program. This funding will go directly to municipalities so that they can build more bike lanes and other cycling infrastructure or choose to enhance existing cycling infrastructure. Speaker, to make cycling an even more convenient option for commuters, we have also created a new cycling web hub that will provide a single point of access Answer. for all things cycling here in Ontario. We'll keep making these critical investments because our government knows that investing in cycling infrastructure makes Thank for you. a safer, more comfortable ride, and that's exactly what helps encourage Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the minister on behalf of the cycling community in my riding. As the minister mentioned, by helping municipalities improve their cycling infrastructure, we're making it easier for people to choose their bike to get around, both for recreation and to get to school and work. As a, as a part-time cyclist, I know that there is nothing better than ride along a trail, discovering new towns and regions, and spending time outdoors with kids, or even something simple as, as simple as riding your bike to work in the morning. It is no secret that cycling in Ontario is experiencing rapid growth, and as many people or more people realize that a fun, uh, this is a fun and healthy form of uh, transportation, Minister. Um, 
through the speaker to you, um, can, can, can you tell us more other incentives happening around the bike months? Good work. Thank you, Minister. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. For tourism, culture, and sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question and for his advocacy. You know, he likely has more cyclists per square meter in his riding than any riding in the country, Speaker. So, he really knows how to look after them, and I appreciate his advocacy. So, very pleased, Speaker, to rise in the House and talk about this announcement because I had a great time on Monday with my colleague, the Minister of Transportation, uh, announcing uh, what is, Speaker, the largest investment in cycling infrastructure in the history of our province. A significant investment that is going to contribute to the extensive trails across our province and the cycling uh, you know, facilities and infrastructure. We're also responding to the growing needs expressed by municipalities, Speaker, and this in turn really is all about cycling tourism as well, which we know grows local economies. Our cycling tourism plan, Tour by Bike, was something I was pleased to announce earlier this year. So, Speaker, our government is clearly committed to investing in cycling, making it easier and safer for people to ride, responding to the needs of municipalities, and working hard with the local tourism officials yes, and non-for-profit who are making this happen, and I want to thank them on behalf of all of us, Speaker, for their diligent work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your question, the member from Chatham, Chet Essex. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. You know, correctional nurses face a difficult dual task of protecting the health and well-being of inmates while also protecting themselves. They face plenty of verbal assaults, as well as being spat at and having feces thrown at them. The good work they do is not possible if they are not safe. Don Goodenough, a nurse and steward with Local 234 at Maplehurst Correctional Complex, said that one of our most urgent needs is finding alternatives to segregation. Mental health is a huge concern right now. To simply say that we can't segregate without viable alternatives in place will only lead to more violence. So, Speaker, to the minister. How does this government plan to address increased violence in our jails, or will they simply leave the hands of our correctional nurses handcuffed? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member actually opposite for, uh, for his question because I had the pleasure uh, this morning of meeting with our correctional nurses, but also uh, in the past few months uh, during my visit into our institution, meeting them and talking with them about some of the challenges that they are experiencing. And at first, I want to say thank you and thank them for their dedication and all their hard work that they do in often difficult and dangerous conditions. Condition, Mr. Speaker. They are the front line on every and every day, and no better than anyone the challenges and the opportunities that exist in our facilities. By working together, we are committed to giving them the tools and the support they need to do their job to the best yes, of their sir. greatest ability. So through our ongoing transformation, Mr. Speaker, we are committed of reaching our share goal, which is to ensure the best possible outcome. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Minister, actions speak louder than words. Explosive reports from Global's Carolyn Jarvis shed new light on the crisis in community corrections due to a lack of resources for overworked probation and parole officers. Ontario's new corrections minister stated that she was unaware of the fact that home visits were not being done. The Attorney General was even more reckless, stating that these concerns were, and I quote, manufactured by the opposition. But the fact is, Speaker, staff have highlighted these issues countless times in the past and were ignored by this ministry. On Sunday, a Sudbury man who was issued a lifetime weapons ban and probation order was arrested after attacking a bus driver with a knife. So, Speaker, to the minister. Why is the rest of the province more concerned with clear issues in community corrections than this government? So, Mr. Speaker, our government takes the safety of our community very, very serious and very seriously. I want to put some facts for the uh, opposite member in terms of uh, the recidivism has dropped 
uh, significantly. The crime rate has declined over by 30 percent. And, and I have to say with a lot of pride that we are currently in the biggest, the greatest transformation of our justice system in generation. And I look at the member opposite asking questions, and I remember their failed Mike Aris hero. When I go to the jail, I'm reminded oh. about what they've done to our correctional right. service. Well, I would say privatizing, but let's not forget cutting services, cutting our correctional staff in there. We are actually rebuilding a system that they're poorly managed for several years, unfortunately. So, Mr. Speaker, I am very Answer. happy of the great work that our parole and probation officer, I have met with their executive, and I'm going to continue engaging to find a solution. The question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, I have been raising concerns about London's mental health crisis since I was first elected, but over those past three and a half years, all this Liberal government has done is make things worse. Two months ago, I shared the story of a constituent forced to lie for a week in a hospital hallway waiting for a mental health bed. Last week, another constituent, David Warren, spent more than three days in the ER waiting for his wife to be transferred to the mental health unit after she had been ordered to go to the hospital through a Form 1. Eventually, she had to go to St. Thomas to get the treatment she required. Does the Premier think it is acceptable that Londoners have to leave their community to access the emergency care they so urgently need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and we continue to make investments in mental health and addiction services across this province, including in London. And it was this government just a couple of years ago that provided the more than $1 million in funding for the operations of the crisis centre, which provides a, a critically important, as the member well knows, a critically important resource for individuals uh, in London who are facing those uh, mental health uh, challenges, Mr. Speaker. But we've also fairly substantially, I would say, increased the budget of London Health Sciences itself. 16 million more dollars to their operating budget this year uh, in addition to the funds in addition to the funds that were provided to them last year which enables them to deal with some of those challenges that they're facing whether that's in the ER whether it's bed capacity mr. speaker but we're working on all fronts Answer. we're working with the hospital we're working with the crisis center we're working with the community to find other measures that can be taken to provide that high quality care yep. Here's supplementary Again to the Premier. Speaker, when my office spoke to the London Health Sciences Centre about David Warren and his wife, staff at the hospital acknowledged that long waits in the ER only worsened the condition of mental health patients. They said that the system had failed David's wife. One of the things that could help is London's proposed mental health diversion project, which could divert as many as 3,000 people a year from the hospital ED to the community-based crisis centre. Five times I have asked this government to approve this pilot project, but the project remains stalled. In fact, London Middlesex Chief Neil Roberts, who is here today, has become so frustrated that he has temporarily withdrawn EMS participation from the project. Does the Premier agree that her government is Question. failing families like David's, and will she commit to implementing London's much-needed mental health pilot project now? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. Well, and uh, of course, I acknowledged uh, Neil at the beginning of question period, and I'm glad that he is here with us uh, uh, on this issue. And Neil himself and other paramedics and EMS uh, providers, they understand the law in the province where they are required to, if they uh, receive uh, an individual, whether it's mental health or physical health uh, situation, they're required by law to deliver that individual to a hospital environment. There was a solution that was suggested to the crisis centre where they could strengthen the relationship between the hospital and the crisis centre run by CMHA that, that would have permitted 
almost overnight, Mr. Speaker, for that solution that the member opposite is looking for to happen. However, notwithstanding their rejection of that solution, which exists in Ottawa and in Sudbury and works quite well, Mr. Speaker, we are working on what I believe is quite an innovative solution. We're working with all partners, EMS, the Lynn, London Health Sciences, CMHA. I wish we were working with the member opposite. I know she's raised this six times. I am prepared to work with her if she'll work with me. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, yesterday the Minister, alongside the Premier, announced the government's exciting response to the changing workplaces review. We heard that the workplace of today is not the same as when legislation was first created to protect workers. Our economy is strong and it is growing. It is outperforming other jurisdictions. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it has been in 16 years, but not everyone is feeling the benefits of our strong economy. People are worried about falling behind even as they work so hard to get ahead. I have heard from constituents and community groups in my riding of Davenport that they are struggling to support their families on part-time, contract or minimum wage work. Our workers want stability in their jobs and to avoid tough decisions on whether they should earn a wage for the day Question. or take care of themselves or their families. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about the government's proposed measures to help safeguard employees and create fair and better Thank workplaces? You. Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, and, uh, I'll tell you how proud I am to stand today and to answer uh, that question from the member from Davenport. I'm so happy to stand uh, today in the House on this really important issue, Speaker. When we launched the Changing Workplaces Review two years ago, we did so on the understanding, Speaker, that workplaces had changed. The workplace that a lot of us entered as young people simply have changed. The legislation needed to change with it. And we know, Speaker, the responsible change can ensure that every hard-working person in the province of Ontario has a chance to reach their full potential. Speaker, Ontario's got a tradition of fairness and decency in our workplaces. They've got to continue to be the defining values, whether it's wage equality that lifts people out of poverty, paid sick days, Speaker, that will allow working parents to take better care of themselves and their children, leaves that allow Ontarians to take care of themselves, yes, their loved ones, Speaker, increased enforcement, Speaker. I am proud of the response of this government, Speaker, to one of the best written reports I've Thank seen you. in the history of Ontario Labour. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answers. I am thrilled to hear about these proposed changes. Minister, you already know that we need to move forward in order to give people a fair chance in today's workplace. A few years back, our government ended the minimum wage freeze that the pre previous Progressive Conservative government had brought in. We put together a plan and a system that raised the minimum wage by 70 per cent since 2003. As a result of those changes, full-time Minimum wage earners in the province are currently making $2,392 per year more than they did three years ago. But, Minister, as I have written and spoken to you in the past, you know that I believe all Ontarians should have a fair and livable wage of $15 an hour. Yesterday, you and the Premier announced that we are going further to support our minimum wage earners. I know that these proposed measures are going to greatly improve the lives of the hardworking people in my riding of Davenport. Can the minister please tell us more about the proposed changes to minimum wage? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, there's no member in this House that has advocated or been involved more than the member for Davenport on this issue. Speaker. She has stood up for her constituents, Speaker, in a way that uh, is unlike many others. Hardworking Ontarians really deserve to be paid that decent wage. Everybody's got to have the right to be able to provide their families with the necessities of daily life. Speaker, what we propose to do is increase Ontario's general minimum wage to $14 per hour on January 1st of 2018 and then to $15 an hour on January 1st of 2019. <laughs> Speaker, that's going to ensure that workers across this province are paid fairly for their work. It's going to help them get ahead. It's going to help them share in the economic prosperity of this province. It's going to support higher consumer spending, higher wages, Speaker, support strong business. That's because Answer. employers don't create uh, customers to 
Customers create the wealth, Speaker. The spending is where it's going to. I can't wait to hear the response from the other parties. You. you know where we stand. Thank you. Your question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Here, here. Speaker, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, today a large number of Welland area residents are here today to voice their concern over the Liberal government's plan to close their hospital. The hospital services the medical, the, the, that are needed over, excuse me, the hospital services treat over 100,000 Welland area residents. However, due to this government's fiscal mismanagement, the health care system has become rationed. Because of the rationing, nurses have been fired, access to services cut, and now the Liberal government is planning to close hospitals across the province. Speaker, area mayors have concerns about that. The replacement of their hospital will make it very difficult to recruit doctors. Speaker, will the minister reconsider the closure, listen to the residents here and across here, here. the province, and Just keep the Welland Hospital open? Here, here. Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to address the Welland Hospital for uh, a second time this morning and, and to do it in the context, as I referenced in my previous answer, of uh, an unprecedented capital investment in our hospitals, $20 billion over the next decade. We added $9 billion in this budget alone that that party, of course, voted against. And one of the specific items referenced in that budget was a new Niagara hospital for the a regional hospital, and we have many regional hospitals around this province, a brand new Niagara hospital which will serve that entire community, including the community the member opposite has expressed concern for, I believe, for the first time. And Mr. Speaker, that brand new hospital is the result of the hard work of individuals like the coalition that's here today and their fight for Welland and other hospitals in that region, which is critically important, and I admire them for that and, and I respect them for that. So we will be uh, working together. I'm happy to talk specifically about Welland in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary, and then from Niagara West Lambert. Mr. Speaker, seniors and families in my riding are also hurting because of liberal mismanagement of health care. Now they're afraid that the minister is going to close the Welland Hospital. Closing this hospital would mean that elderly and sick and remote rural communities would have to travel almost an hour to reach an emergency room. One elderly family is very concerned because they have no public transit and do not know how they will be able to receive the care they need and visit their loved ones in hospital. So, Speaker, my question is simple, and it's to the minister. Why must you make seniors and families pay for the waste and mismanagement of this Shame. Liberal government? Shameful. 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 Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And perhaps the member opposite can check uh, Hansard from about 40 minutes ago when I specifically and I think emphatically uh, expressed my commitment to do everything I could to keep Welland Hospital open. I've met with the local mayor. I've let, met with the mayors throughout the region, including Mayor Campion, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've uh, met with the uh, certainly the, the NDP party that has uh, for some time, to their credit, unlike the PCs who have addressed this as a concern of the communities involved and mr. speaker I will work with the community and with the Lynn and the local leadership to see what solution is best for that community and as I said before we have made no decision there has been no decision made in terms of the future of the well and hospital uh, we are building a brand new uh, hospital for the Niagara region we've given them a 26 million dollar planning grant we're going to continue with the capital Thanks, investment that commitment is in the budget a budget that that member voted against your yeah. question the member from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Two days ago, we learned that the government's plan for cleaning up the Wabagoon River is to offload this responsibility onto somebody else. The Ontario government intends to make Domtar responsible for cleaning up the mercury, even though decades ago the Ontario government formally declared that Domtar is not responsible for cleaning up the mercury. This is a cynical ploy to delay action on cleaning up the mercury that is poisoning the people of Grassy Narrows and Wobs among First Nations. Will the Premier stop these stalling tactics and get to work on cleaning up the Wabagoon River? Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I, I know that the Minister of the Environment and uh, Climate Change is going to want to speak uh, to the supplementary. Mr. Speaker, just let me be very, very clear. We are committed to cleaning up 
the Grassy Narrows water system, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, we've made a commitment to that. There is work that has begun already, Mr. Speaker. As part of that, there is a commitment, and I made this commitment when we were meeting with, uh, with folks from, uh, from the community, with the chief, Mr. Speaker, and with the scientist, uh, John Rudd, who has been part of, uh, of these discussions, Mr. Speaker, and with David Suzuki. Um, yes, we are calling on Don Tarr to take responsibility, Mr. Speaker, but that is not that is not going to stop us from moving ahead and cleaning up the water in the Grassy Narrows community, Mr. Speaker. That is not in any way going to stop us from, uh, from doing that cleanup. Right. Thank you. Supplementary. The Premier is well aware that Ontario's Superior Court has ruled that it is illegal to offload their responsibility. She doesn't care that what she is doing is illegal. She knows that she will lose this latest court battle. Her goal is not to win. Her goal is to delay. All the while, families in Grassy Narrows and Wapsamung are literally dying of mercury poisoning. Will the Premier listen to her conscience, stop this pointless delay, and get to work cleaning up the mercury once and for all? Premier. The so, environment and climate change. We're doing what that party didn't do in government. We're enforcing the law, Mr. Speaker. We are holding companies who pollute when there is additional sources. And if your government had done it, we wouldn't be having this discussion. If the party opposite had enforced the law, we wouldn't be having it. The member is confused between the remediation of the river, Mr. Speaker. She should listen. The remediation of the river, we are moving the science from two years to one year, fast tracking it. That money is going. The remediation of the river is doing. But if you think we shouldn't hold Sheriff, corporations please. to account, when did the NDP become so sloppy in enforcing the law? You're demanding we don't enforce the law? Can you say it, please? Start the clock. Member from Windsor to come see knows better. No question. Member from Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Seniors Affairs. Uh, Minister, my riding of Etobicoke Centre is home to one of the largest populations of seniors in Ontario, and that's why issues that affect seniors are one of my priorities. Uh, that's why I hold a monthly seniors advisory group. That's why I hosted a consultation on the dementia strategy, why I've been an advocate for funding for our local hospitals like Etobicoke General and Trillium, and why this week I introduced a bill that would ban telemarketing sales, harassing phone calls that many of our seniors receive and are concerned about. Minister, last week, the 2016 Canadian Census confirmed that the number of seniors in Canada is still growing. In fact, in Ontario, the seniors' population is projected to double over the next 25 years to 4 million people. And for the first time, there are now more Ontarians over the age of 65 than there are children under the age of 15. So, Minister, my question to you is, can you update us on what question. we are doing as a government and what is in our budget to help seniors in Ontario? Minister of Seniors Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to begin by thanking the member from Etobicoke Centre for the important question, but more importantly, Speaker, for the advocacy work he does on behalf of seniors in his riding. I've had the opportunity to firsthand see him in action with his Seniors Advisory Committee, and I just have to say he does an outstanding job. The challenge I have, Mr. Speaker, is that we're doing so much for seniors that I'm afraid I will run out of time, but I'm going to try and give you a flavor. As part of our budget, the government is providing $8 million over the next three years to support the creation of 40 new elderly person centers, soon to be renamed as the Seniors Active Living Center. Mr. Speaker, this is going to increase the number of these EPCs from about 360 to 400. We're also committing about $11 million over three years to provide further funding Answer. for the very popular Seniors Community Grant Program that's already helped over a quarter of a million seniors in just three years. I could go on, Mr. Speaker, Thank but I'm you. out of time. No, Supplementary. 
Thanks very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And Minister, I know those investments that you talk about will make a difference. Um, we want seniors living happy, healthy, active lives, and some of these investments will certainly assist in that. Actually, uh, since you mention it, as we speak, I'm actually working with a group in my community who's working on trying to establish a community hub so that we can deliver those services that seniors need in their community uh, in an accessible way. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, I know in addition to the things that you mentioned, there are other elements in the budget, there are other things that we are doing. I know you said there's a lot you wanted to talk about. So, Minister, could you expand a little bit on the things that we're doing for seniors in this province? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'm so glad for the opportunity of this supplementary so I can continue to talk about what our government is doing for seniors. For instance, Mr. Speaker, Ontario is increasing the health care investments by $11.5 billion over the next three years to increase access to care, reduce wait times, and enhance patient experience, including, Mr. Speaker, a brand new hospital, but, um, sorry, an expansion of the hospital in my riding of Mrs. Uh, in, in my city of Mississauga uh, by $350 beds. And recently, I was with Minister Hoskins at Baycrest, where we announced an additional $100 million, Mr. Speaker, over three years for dementia. This will include funding to expand province-wide access to community programs and other investments to enhance access to care. And finally, Mr. Speaker, Ontario is helping seniors cover Answer. the cost of public transit with the proposed Ontario Seniors Public Transit Tax Credit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Almost 15 years ago, the Romano Report identified an inverse care law for rural and remote communities. It says people in rural communities have poor health status and greater needs for primary health care, yet they are not as well served and have more difficulty accessing health services than people in urban areas. Speaker, does the minister accept this fact, and if so, will he reject any re proposal to take long-term care beds out of rural Ontario, where many homes have already have long waiting lists, and does the minister agree that simplistic so-called bed ratios don't tell the full story? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it'd be, uh, there are so many parts to that and so many questions I was asked. I'm not sure if it's wise for me to—I think I'll say yes to the first part which was the, uh, the, the, the evidence, the science, uh, in terms of disparities that exist, which are well acknowledged, and the social determinants of health that are often behind that. In fact, there's an HQO report that came out recently looking at that situation in the northern part of this province. But the other pieces, I'm just not sure how I should declare myself. Maybe he'll be more specific in the supplementary. But certainly, it points to the importance of the uh, investment that we made this year that that party regrettably voted against of a 3.1 percent increase to the operating budget of our hospitals, uh, Mr. Speaker, to an $11 billion cumulative increase uh, in our uh, health care budget Answer. over the next three years. Significant billion. investment as well in long-term care, including important elements like the food allocation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I'm curious as to the supplementary uh, where this might be going. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, Hillside Manor near Sebringville is slated to close. This government is considering a proposal to move as many as 50 long-term care beds to London, and we still don't know what will happen to Hillside's remaining 40 beds. If London needs more beds, give them more beds, but don't drag us down to the lowest common denominator. In my, my, at my constituency office, the phones are ringing, emails are pouring in. Municipalities are writing letters and passing resolutions. They are totally re opposed to this bed transfer, and they want to be heard. Will this government listen? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the clarity from the member opposite. And I, because I recall, I know that he's written to me on the subject, the subject of Hillside Manor, and uh, and he knows as a result of that uh, exchange uh, that uh, that no decision has been made, Mr. Speaker, with regards to uh, the the balance or the allocation or any potential uh, moving of licenses or long-term care beds, including for for Hillside. What has begun as is required under the law, Mr. Speaker, as we look to redevelop uh, 30,000 long-term care beds across this province to provide greater support and greater care, that it's required that long-term home operators that they consult with the community. In fact, I explicitly asked, which is likely how the member found out, that the 
long-term care operator specifically consult with the local members of provincial parliament as well as other leadership, uh, our local leaders. That's yes, the process that's been undertaken. Is that appropriate community consultation? No decisions have been have been taken. I beg to inform the House that the following document was tabled. A report on the Economic and Fiscal Outlook Spring 2017 of the Finance and Accountability Office of Ontario. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 134, an act to implement 2017 budgets. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members, please take your seats. I thought we were supposed to do it. Your On May 30, 2017, Mr. Zimmer moved second reading of Bill 134. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barardnetti. Mr. Barardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Diller. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cardi. Mr. Cardi. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Darmel. Ms. Darmel. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wall. Ms. Wall. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dog. Mr. Dog. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kowal. Ms. Kowal. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Renal. Mr. Renal. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Madam Angelina. Madam Angelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubas. Mr. Yakubas. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urey. Mr. Urey. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. McClare. Mr. McClare. The ayes are 67, the nays are 26. The ayes being 67, the nays being 26, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, does your lecture appropriate to Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? The Minister of Finance. To the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Motion, so shall it be. We have a deferred vote of the motion of third reading of Bill 132, an act to enact the Fair Hydro Plan Act 2017 to make amendments to the Electricity Act 1998 and the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Earlier today, Ms. McCharles moved third reading of Bill 132, an act to amend uh, to enact the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan Act 2017 and make amendments to the Electricity Act 1998 and the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Nathan. Mr. Nathan. Mr. Nathan. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynne. Ms. Wynne. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. 
Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barardinetti. Mr. Barardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Meridian. Mr. Meridian. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Ms. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cartridge. Mr. Cartridge. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Craft. Mr. Craft. Ms. Domala. Ms. Domala. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Your recognition is Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McCloud. Mr. McCloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubowski. 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 Mr.